Changes to the definition of the term catastrophic impairment are coming. I'm here to tell you what we can anticipate and some of the problems or issues that we should turn our attention to right now. We've had the same definition for 15 years, and we finally, finally have a common understanding of what it means. The Ontario Court of Appeal has a number of recent decisions which clarify all of the tests. We can now look as legal representation for clients and have some sense of certainty of which way it's going to go, catastrophic or non-catastrophic. Finally, it took us 15 years to get here. But unfortunately, everything is going back to basics. There's a complete overhaul coming. And just to make sure that people understand what we're talking about, catastrophic impairment is a legal definition that's found in the statutory accident benefit schedule. Anyone injured in a car accident, whether a pedestrian hit by a car or a passenger or driver, automatically is eligible for no-fault benefits. And those benefits change drastically depending on the severity of your injury. If your injury is catastrophic and meets this legal definition of catastrophic impairment, it opens the door up to up to $2 million extra in benefits. When if you don't meet this legal definition, you're stuck with $50,000 of medical benefits and $36,000 of attendant care benefits. So there's a major difference and much of our work and effort um, is focused on making sure our clients qualify as having a catastrophic impairment so that they can have those $2 million of benefits available if needed. So my presentation is going to quickly review the recent developments, discuss the anticipated changes, and provide an update on where we are heading. Firstly, just a quick background of where and how we got here. The Financial Services Commission of Ontario, FISCO, did a five-year review. They're mandated to do one every five years. It was issued in 2009. And it made major recommendations, one of them being we should review the definition of catastrophic impairment. It also said, recommendation number one, don't make changes unless there's a compelling reason to do so, and don't make changes that are going to add complexity. I'm not sure that's, uh, that's what's heading. A CAT expert panel was put together and they came out with a comprehensive report last year that made drastic changes to the proposed changes to the catastrophic impairment definition. And they also issued a phase two report that dealt with what assessors doing catastrophic impairment um, classifications, uh, what kind of training and experience they should have. In response to the CAT expert panel report, stakeholders made submissions, extensive submissions, and many of the organizations you're all involved with today in the CPAO all made submissions with various concerns, one being the requirement in a number of the tests for patients to have been admitted to as an inpatient in a rehab hospital. Um, and various other ones dealing with the thresholds and other issues. Since then, um, there's been a standing committee, standing committee hearing that, that was coordinated by the Minister of Finance, and it's a, a subcommittee on auto insurance. And they've had multiple days of hearings to review the CAT expert panel's conclusions and figure out how that may have to be tweaked to address many of the stakeholders' concerns. And again, many of the people in the room have been represented in front of that standing committee. During that hearing, the superintendent and members from FISCO testified in front of the standing committee, and they were asked about their thoughts, and they disclosed the fact that they had issued a report to the Minister of Finance, and the standing committee said, well, can we see it? And as a result of that request, the report was released in June of this year. That's the superintendent's recommendations in response to the CAT expert panel's report. That superintendent's recommendation report is at tab A of my paper. Now, it's dated December 15th, or December of 2011, but it was only issued in June. There is some good in the superintendent's report. For one, he's eliminated the inpatient requirement altogether in almost every test. So that's a very good development, and that likely arises as a result of all the stakeholder complaints. What I'm going to do is quickly review the new tests. Okay, you'll see here's a an overview of what they are. You have the Asia test, the spinal cord independence measure, the Glasgow outcome scale, the Glasgow out outcome scale as the extended one. You have the WPI test, which is the same, but prohi prohibiting a combination of psychological and physical impairments. You have the uh, cost scale, the King's outcome scale for child childhood head injuries. Um, the GAF, the introduction of the GAF, the global assessment of functioning and the issue of interim benefits. And then I'm going to quickly 
review, if I have time, the CAD assessor's qualifications and the, what the superintendent has to say about that. The one thing I want you to keep in mind as I quickly go through them is I've been struggling with why I'm so offended with the definition. Some of the changes aren't bad. Some of them may lower the threshold. Uh, I think what my problem is is that they've changed the definition to deal with level of functioning, which sounds like a really good thing. But as we've been hearing all morning, the level of functioning changes with effective rehabilitation. So, and the level of functioning is assessed periodically, six months, nine months, 12 months, as you'll see. So if you guys do a good job and the person makes improvements, they may not qualify as catastrophic and therefore have a lifetime of benefits of a, an extra $2 million to access if needed. So they'll be stuck, if you're using a scholastic analogy, at getting D's in school. But if you fail, it opens up the door to the $2 million. And we want to see people get better. So we'd prefer them to be qualified at the beginning, like you can right now with the GCS test, and make improvements and have the access to those benefits but not need them. Instead, the level of functioning is assessed periodically. And if you make too many improvements, you're not going to qualify, and then your benefits are going to be shut off because you've used your $50,000. So let's quickly review the tests. And if you can turn tab B of my paper is a chart. I'm known to make charts. So here's another one of my charts. This happens to be a six pager and it's not my fault. It's the fault of the legislature who makes lengthy definitions. But on the chart, you will see uh, in the left category is what the current SABS definitions are. And then in the larger column in black are what the expert panel recommended and in red is the superintendent's recommendations and how he alters the uh, experts panel's recommendations. So dealing first with the Asia test. Uh, and if you look at the wording, it uses the word permanent grades and it uses the word permanent inability to walk. Again, these are legal nightmares for lawyers because what I think is permanent is not the same as what the defense lawyers generally think is permanent and may not be the same as uh, various medical doctors think is permanent. So we got one problem right there. There's also the reference to grade D. Okay, grade D for under the Asia scale is, is a spinal cord injury where the motor function prescribed, preserved below the neuro neurological level and at least half of the key muscles below the neurological level have a muscle grade of three or more. So there have been va various complaints about that threshold and the argument that it's just too high. And uh, this idea of being able to walk 10 meters indoor and therefore not qualifying is, is too high a standard and is not realistic. It doesn't account for the real factors and living in the real world and going outside and uh, accessing homes. So uh, that's one issue. Going to the next test, we have dealing with amputations. Uh, again, there's a reference to the permanent inability to walk independently. Okay, so the same 10 meter test. And again, there are complaints that the threshold is too high. And on, you'll see on these slides, I put up the concerns are uncertainty and delay, because that's generally the problem, the concerns we have. New tests mean new legal jurisprudence, delay, uncertainty, a lack of agreed designations of catastrophic impairment. The, la the next one is the, Glasgow, the extended Glasgow outcome scale. There's nothing wrong with the scale. The problem is the elimination of the GCS. The GCS is, uh, is the easiest, most straightforward way to qualify as catastrophic impairment. The ambulance shows up on scene, they measure your alertness. If you have a nine or less, you're automatically catastrophic. You can access these benefits if needed. They've eliminated that. And they've added in the extended Glasgow out outcome scale. And they've put in durations on, after which you can be tested. One month for vegetative, six months for severe disability upper or lower, and then one year to access the test under the moderate disability lower, which the key features of which, for those aren't from, who aren't familiar, is not able to work or only in a sheltered or non-competitive position, unable to participate or rarely if ever in regular social and leisure activities outside the home, and constant and intolerable daily disruption of family relationships or friendships due to psychological problems. So this is a moving curve. A year after the accident, you may qualify, or if you've had great rehab, you may not. You may have major problems. You may be on the moderate disability 
upper, but not qualify. So again, it's this interplay between effective rehab disqualifying the person from meeting the test. With respect to the whole person impairment test, it's remained the 55%, but there's been an express prohibition on combining the psychological and physical factors. Now, I mentioned earlier that the superintendent's report was issued in December, and that happened to be a couple weeks before the Ontario Court of Appeal rendered a decision saying it's, it's unfair to do just that. So I've been taking the perspective that the superintendent may very well revisit his position in light of what the Ontario Court of Appeal said would be completely unfair. So it may in fact be illegal and hopefully they'll tweak that test to expressly allow the combination in accordance with what the Ontario Court of Appeal had to say. Psychological impairments, I don't have a lot of time, but um, they introduced the Global Assessment of Functioning Score of 40 or less. And many stakeholders have said this is way way too high a threshold and nobody will qualify. Children, some good changes with children. Automatic cat designation. If you're in a hospital and you have positive findings of a brain impairment or you go to a rehab hospital. And then they introduce the uh, King's Outcome Scale for Childhood Head Injuries, which is similar to the Glasgow Outcomes, the Extended Glasgow Outcome Scale, um, but more suitable for children. So that is a very good development with the automatic catastrophic designation. Interim benefits. The superintendent suggests that an extra $50,000 be available to people who are trying to make a claim under the extended Glasgow outcome scale or the whole person impairment test. But he says it has to be managed by the primary treating physician and some other uh, requirements. And it's unclear how that's in fact going to be implemented and whether it's really manageable. I mean, if you're already fighting with the insurance company over the designation, I'm not sure they're going to be the easiest ones to let everything you want by way of treatment to be, uh, be allowed. So they may fight you on all that stuff. With respect to CAD assessors at tab C of my paper, there's a quick one-page chart summarizing the credentials. For They've recommended that a single lead evaluator or a single evaluator be responsible, that that person be a doctor or a doctor level, doctorate level neuropsychologist with five years of licensing or registration. They must have training in the measurement tools they're going to use. There was a suggestion about university-based training, but that's been uh, removed by way of the superintendent's um, recommendations. And he said, we'll give everyone a year to be trained on the new tests. But then again, the process of how you become certified and, and eligible is unclear. And if they reduce the fees for doing these assessments, you may lose some of the most qualified people who would otherwise be doing the tests. And then the question becomes, who pays for them? And when you have these levels, these tests that vary by duration, do you do them once, do you do them twice, do you do them three times? Who pays for them? Where does it come from? Where are we heading? This, these changes are coming. Um, a draft regulation. What I'm, what I'm showing here is not any draft regulation. This is what the expert panel said as modified by the superintendent. Now typically the lawyers get involved and they take what the experts have said and try to put it into legal wording. But they largely rely on the wording for, from the medical aspects. A draft wording when it came to the last round of changes was introduced to small working groups and there was input allowed and some small changes were made. Um, but the final wording of all these tests is crucial. How they're worded, how they're, especially with things like the whole person impairment test. My prediction is that for September 1st, 2013, we'll have a new definition. And that changes a lot of your practices if you're a case manager because if there's no GCS test and uh, somebody suffers a severe head injury, they're not going to be entitled to a case manager off the bat. We're going to have to wait three, six, nine months under the Glasgow Outcome Scale or a year to figure out the person's catastrophic, which means we can't engage case managers unless the insurance companies cooperate. So it does raise some problems in terms of file management and rehabilitation. Conclusion. We still have a little bit of time to influence the government. No changes have been made. The Standing Committee heard submissions uh, last month. Uh, I, I believe that the government would be open to minor changes, and I know th these many organizations here today are still presenting some. So those are good things. We shouldn't stop trying to influence the government. We need to focus on how we're going to work together going forward. If we can't appoint case managers, we're going to have to be innovative in our solutions. Can we protect accounts with instructions from the clients? Can we um, prioritize rehab? Can we rush 
the lawsuits against any at-fault drivers to access advanced payments or outcomes. So check our website for more information. Uh, again, I'd expect a draft regulation out probably close to the end of the year, if not first thing in 2013, um, with changes implemented September 1st. Um, thank you for your attention.